Aloha, another edition of Condo Insider. It's now the beginning of 2019. We just finished 2018, an exciting year. And that's a new situation because now we're in a new year. And that means it's the season of annual meetings for condominiums and other associations like homeowner associations. So I thought we might have a little primer on associations, the do's and don'ts. So I invited my very good friend, Steve Glanstein, professional registered parliamentarian, to join me again. Happy New Year, Steve, and welcome. Thank you, Richard. Happy New Year. And uh, just remind everybody, I know you're a professional registered parliamentarian. Kind of what organization governs or teaches or, or manages this, this and, and what is a PRP, as we say? Well, a PRP stands for Professional Registered Parliamentarian. And I'm nationally certified as a professional registered parliamentarian by the National Association of Parliamentarians. It's the largest group of parliamentarians in the country. They were formed about 1930. They've been around for quite some time. And do you do meetings other than associations? Yes, I do churches. I've done union meetings. I've done dog club meetings. I've done various types of other meetings. But the majority of my practice is condominiums, community associations. But, you know, we've been now, I think this is around 130 episodes of Condo Insider we've done, trying to educate owners and board members. So we haven't put you out of business yet? No, actually you gave me a lot of business. I got about 32 different meetings in March. Each one has a separate set of documents totaling up to 100 pages and I've got to keep them all together and try not to get too many people angry at me during that month. Well, let's talk about the do's and don'ts of annual meetings. Sure. So what is the first do? First do is have your annual meeting. You've got to have an annual meeting. If you're a condominium community association, you've got statutory requirements and you generally have requirements in your bylaws. Have that meeting. And to have the meeting, what are the basic things you should be cautious about to do in preparation and you know, organizing the annual meeting? Well, the, one of the most important parts of the annual meeting is to have proper notice, proper legal requirements, make sure you comply with the statutes as well as your bylaws to actually have the notice of the meeting and try to make the meeting in a place that exists because these things have happened where they've made mistakes on notices. They've put meetings in the wrong time, the wrong location. So you need to make sure that preparation is, is adequately done and th then have your meeting at the appropriate venue. So you're supposed to give a proper notice, the time, date, place, location, yeah. a real location to hold the meeting. So what happens if you screwed up? Fix it. <laughs> What yeah. other, way, what other in, ways to fix in some, it? There are some ways to fix it. If it's a notice <laughs> posting, you can amend it. If, if you're outside of the general notice period, you can have an amended notice, do something like that. In the real worst case scenario where you've actually violated the law when it comes to notice of the meeting, you may have to actually reschedule a completely different annual meeting. So let's just say you have an annual meeting properly noticed at a proper location, and you get there to room 101 where you're going to hold the meeting, and for some reason, there's a water leak in that room, and they've asked you to go into room 102. Can they do that? Yes, they can. So what you do is you call the meeting to order in 101. Um, I would joke, while treading water, call the meeting to order, and then continue the meeting to 102. Now, you're not required in the parliamentary world to post a notice, but it's a good operating practice to post some kind of notice to your owners. And if they show up later, we're in 102, not in 101. Right. It's kind so there's of ways obvious. to deal with it through a parliamentary yeah, procedure. Well. Through a parliamentary procedure. Well, you know, to me, one of the most important dues for an annual meeting is do have a quorum. <laughs> Tell us about quorums and, and what the, what's all about. Yeah, a quorum is the minimum amount of representation at a meeting in order to constitute an official act of the organization. So, for example, if an organization has, just to keep it really simple, a uh, hundred units totaling a hundred percent. Everybody has a one percent interest. The quorum usually is a, more, a little bit more than fifty, just over fifty, and that's so that you don't have an unrepresentative group taking action in the name of the entire organization. And I hear oftentimes in conducting meetings the terms majority of the association and majority of those present. How, how would, can you define for our audience the difference yeah. between? That technical argument. Yeah. Well, when you look for those technical arguments, it's important to look in your documents. But the general explanation of a majority of the ownership, a majority of unit owners, is more than half of all owners, regardless of how many you're at a meeting. 
And that's usually done through a percentage of common interest in the case of condominiums, through lots or own, individual ownership in the case of a homeowners association, plan community association. That's a majority of all now, or a majority of unit owners. Majority present means you look at what is represented at that meeting, regardless of whether it can vote or not, and that majority present would be more than half of it. One follow-up, the word majority is really simple. It doesn't mean one more than half. It means more than half. So when you hear the word majority, you can just think more than half. So I think the most common thing in associations when it comes to plays and People get hoo-hoo with their directors and they want to remove them. That's the statute's clear. It's the majority of the homeowners. So they may have a well-attended meeting, but they may not get a majority of all of the owners present or not present to remove a board. Is that a simple way to describe it? Um, for condominiums. Community associations may be different, but for condominiums, that's correct. You need to have the affirmative vote of a majority of all unit owners in order to remove uh, one or more board members at an owner's meeting. And, uh, and the homeowner association, different than a condo, would be different because their governing documents specify a different standard. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's, that's partially right. It's not just their governing documents. You've got two different chapters of the state law that have to be balanced with their documents and their association attorney gets involved. It's not that simple with, home, with planned community associations. No, I'm an expert on a case right now. And... Uh, and the issue is you look at a approximate 2,500 homeowner units in a homeowner association, and quorum for the meeting is odd. It says 50 owners plus five directors. Mm -hmm. You know, so in theory, I would think that if none of the directors showed up, you couldn't have a quorum based on the way that literal reading of that. I'm not sure what the state law says, but, uh, uh, but 50 people out of 2,500 is a very small percentage of the total membership. Well, it, it may be a small percentage of the membership, but by adding those directors in as part of the quorum, that association has essentially handicapped themselves if they have a, con a contentious issue between the board of directors and the rest of the association. Yeah, I can, I can see that yeah. being the issue. So anyway, proxies, they count for establishing quorum. Yeah, proxies can count for establishing quorum you know, they have to be properly executed. They have to comply with the statute. They can be used. They have to be turned in in a timely manner. And they can be used for establishing a quorum. Correct. So if I'm an owner, you know, you know, the association always sends out this official proxy. Yep. And the statute requires these four boxes. You know, a board majority, board equals, we say, designated to an individual or quorum only. But let's just say I'm an owner, I lost that. I take a paper towel and I write down all the statutory required information I, Richard Emery, owner of Unit 207, do hereby appoint Steve Glanstein as my proxy holder for the annual meeting being conducted on July 1, 2019 at 8 o'clock in the rec center. and had all the statutory information in there, and it got delivered to the secretary in advance. It's 48 hours as the requirement under the current statute for a condo. Would you be advising uh, them to accept that proxy? Well... The advising on acceptance of a proxy is, is really a legal matter, but it's got to be 4.30 p.m. the second business day, which is not always 48 hours. Right. And, it, of course, it's got to have the name of the association, but if it complies with the statute and it's turned in in conjunction with the statute, statutory requirements, it's a valid proxy. Uh, now, that's one advantage of the statute that we've gotten changed, is to have that 20, that two-day period, because management is able to check those proxies and make sure that they comply rather than have somebody bring a stack of proxies in 20 minutes before the meeting and say, I'm here, now you've got to accept all my proxies. So we do have some deadlines on that to help management companies to make sure they can sift through these proxies. Well, I've seen that as a problem where people have walked in the door with proxies and they didn't submit them uh, by 4.30, the two business days prior. And management companies have to say, I'm sorry, but pursuant to the statute, we can't accept this. Yeah, and there's very few exceptions. That actually, cooperatives, they can still come walking on after if the documents allow it. But for most of our practice, for condominium associations, planned community associations, it's 4.30 p.m. second business day prior. And keep in mind, business day. What about Cohio day? What about Ham day? Some, some management companies work on those days. Some don't. So you have to make sure you, you're, you're following that statute with respect to the deadlines. And so... Are those proxies, can, can owners look at them? Are they, like other people's proxies? 
Well, if they want to inspect the proxies or see who gave what proxy to who, those inspection rights start after the meeting's adjourned and not prior. So let's just say I'm an owner in a meeting. And this, this happens. And I say, you know, I've been told that people are giving me proxies. And I call the management company and I say, can I ask you who gave me proxies? Not the whole thing, but just those that, can, can the management company tell me? Well, it's really truly a legal question with respect to interpreting the statute when it comes to whether they can tell you. The general practice from my experience is they're very restrictive as far as letting people know even who gave them proxies. Because if you know who gave proxies, that gives you the opportunity to go and bang on everybody else's door for those who didn't give you proxies and say, how come I didn't have a proxy? And one of the reasons that we pushed through that statute to make the proxy information available after the meeting was to protect owners from being harassed to constantly turn proxies in to one group or another. You know, I think that's the issue. People, yeah. owners don't always like to say, they'll say yes, and, yeah. but they really aren't going to give you the proxy. Yeah. And meanwhile, that person's calling, trying to figure out his voting power. Yeah. And if he doesn't get the information, if he did get the information, he'd be calling you in the phone saying, I thought right. you told me I was getting my proxy. Yeah. You know, which is part of the, part of the problem. So, well, the way, the way proxy solicitors solve that problem, people soliciting proxies, they solve that by getting the proxy themselves from the owner, they execute, and then they turn them all into the management company prior to, you know, prior to the meeting, two or three days before the meeting. That's the way they, they, they handle that. However, as far as man, many of the management companies, the larger ones, they do not make that information available to individual owners until after the meeting. I went to a meeting, I was a very bad boy, I have to tell you, because Which I had one? enough proxies <laughs> to put myself on the board, cumulative voting. And for the day before the meeting, between all of the infighting and outfighting for this, we all made an agreement the night before the meeting how we get equal, I shouldn't say equal, but representation from all the factions on the board. We'd all work together mm -hmm. to solve the association's problem. And I went to bed that night. And by the time I got up the next day, I had texts, emails, phone messages, all saying, I've changed my mind. I'm reneging on the agreement. And what happened was, so when I voted all my proxies, I voted all my proxies for the people they didn't want on the board. <laughs> so I didn't elect myself. Okay. Because the reality of it was, if people go back on their word, I just didn't want to be involved yeah. in it. And so I took my moment, I've done this for 25 years, to basically say, well, they, I knew how all the proxies were set, and I had, at least based on what they told me. And uh, so I just put, made it a very diverse group. Sure. And so, these are political issues that, that organizations go through where one group decides to support another or they change their support. It's, it's not entirely unusual. It, it's a little bit more unusual to see someone who's got a huge amount of proxies and they're able to control the entire board. So, briefly, what is the purpose of an enemy? Why do we have them? Well, there's just a few purposes. First of all, it's electing directors. There's also a purpose with respect to presenting certain reports. And there's another purpose that's come down in the last 30 years called a tax resolution. There's an IRS tax resolution that many associations and condominiums actually adopt in order to, to, to help uh, minimize the risk of, of having to pay taxes. And then that's basic purpose. Well, I know some kind of documents also may have a requirement that the ownership approve the auditor or the ownership approve the managing agent's contract. And uh, uh, so there's a bunch of purposes that, uh, you know, that are just part of the normal annual business that's important to do because if you didn't file your tax resolution through the meeting and have the rollover of those funds, those excess funds, you'd have to pay taxes. So not having a meeting could put your association at risk. Well, it's, not, it's even worse than that. Having a meeting that doesn't have a quorum that can't adopt a tax resolution is, it has the same sort of effect. You have not adopted the tax resolution. So you want to make sure, as an association, that you have the tax resolution blessed by your CPA, get your annual meeting, and make sure that that tax resolution is properly adopted. Okay, well, we're going to take a short break for one minute. We'll be right back with Steve Glanstein talking about annual meetings, you know, and uh, very interesting, but we have more questions. 
And we got what, one minute, two minutes? Yeah, I couldn't <laughs> tell whether you were talking to me or you didn't have your mic off, because I had after you, so I had you chattering by. Wait, how do you guys know about at, that? <laughs> so I was paying such close attention to Steve, I ignored everything you said. <laughs> this is cool. Where's Jay? <laughs> How did you guys know about this fall prevention I've been doing? <laughs> I must tell you about fall prevention. Every 11 seconds, somebody falls, goes into an emergency room because of a fall. Okay, so we got this, we got quorum, we got rollover res. Oh yeah, good, you got that. Insurance requirement, no collection of rent. Those are one-time deals. We got that. You want to make sure you get E, yes? About what? Sub, uh, item 4E about interfering. What about other motions that come up? You know, they want the board of directors to... Um... Oh, I've got one for you. Welcome back to Condo Insider. with Steve Glanstein talking about annual meetings. And, you know, we were talking about the purpose of the annual meeting. And, and I guess one of the questions is, can owners make motions at annual meetings? And... And are they binding on the board? Well, it depends on the bylaws, Richard. Most bylaws that, that in my practice with condominiums and community associations, they require that the board manage the property. They vest in the board that authority. With some exceptions, for example, a design committee might actually manage approval of design plans, construction. Now, when the bylaws say that this is the group that's responsible for managing the property or managing design requests, you can't interfere with that. That means an owner's meeting that says, you know, I move that the, the, the board members go out and raise the maintenance fees or reduce the maintenance fees to zero. Uh, motions like that are generally going to be ruled out of order. Yeah, I've seen that happen where people said, I move to reduce the maintenance fees yeah. 20%. And more times than not, it's ruled out of order because the bylaws give the board that authority. But I've seen that as a workaround on that is I moved that the board is requested to review the maintenance fees to determine are there ways that we can reduce them by 20%. Kind of an advisory motion, yeah. not telling them to do something, but saying we as the ownership would like the board to look at this issue. Yeah. Is that legal? Yeah, well, legal's for lawyers, but in the parliamentary world, the practice that we have is we will actually meet with somebody during a recess of the meeting, say, look, that motion's gonna be out of order. If you make a motion recommending that the board take a look at the budget, the maintenance fees, and reconsider their action. It's a recommendation, it's not binding, but it also saves that person the embarrassment of having their motion ruled out of order. And generally, motions that recommend things like that usually pass. There's a, a, a lot of experience with that because it takes about 20 minutes to count a lot of the votes on motions like that. So, so usually boards are okay if it's a non-binding re, uh, recommendation, and they will take a look at it in my experience. And I've seen, as in the 25 years, these non-binding recommendations fail. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, in some cases, they are, have actually been forced to a vote and failed. Yes. So, so one of the interesting things we, you can do in an annual meeting is amend the bylaws and the declaration, for example. Sure. But I believe there's a difference between the board making the recommendation and an owner making the recommendation at a meeting that the, if I remember correctly, that the board has to announce in advance of the meeting this recommended bylaw or declaration amendment, where in actuality an owner of the meeting is not bound by that. Is that? That's substantially correct. The board, the board has to put it in the notice, including a rationale, if they're going to amend the documents, um, and if they're going to do it in the condos or community associations, whereas an owner can stand up and, and, and make that motion right then and there at, at an annual meeting. The one I've seen most prevalent on that, and prevalent means in my 25 years, maybe three times, hmm. where the owner has got up and said, I move to eliminate cumulative voting. And it was an owner proffered um, um, suggestion because some people like it and some people don't like cumulative voting. And they had to vote and meanwhile, now the owner, the board has a whole bunch of proxy. They can vote one way or the other on it. Right. And, uh, uh, that happens occasionally. Right. Well, and if it's in a condominium world, any, any amendment to the documents has to be recorded before it's effective. So even if they had the required percentage to adopt it, 
in the condominium world. It would not take effect that night. They'd have to record it. In the community association world, you have to look at your documents. It might be different. But they do, it, usually bylaw amendments have a pretty high vote requirement. So it's going to need, it's going to need some, some, a higher percentage of owners who are in favor of it. How about the elections when the, when the bylaws say something, not less than five, not more than nine directors. And so you have seven. And so you're getting ready to elect the vacancies of the seven. Can an owner make a motion, I move to expand the board to nine, or would that be binding at that meeting? Or Yeah, if, yeah, if the bylaws allow for, for the ownership, you have to look at the wording real carefully. The bylaws allow for the ownership to select the size of the board, then they sure could do it right there. And some boards have done that. In, the fa in fact, they've done that because it's been so apathetic that when they get a couple of board members who want to be on, they'll, they'll expand the board in, in line with the bylaws in order to get those people on. They're just happy to have people on the board. Yeah, well, getting people on the board is, is a difficult challenge. Well, how about this issue? So you have cumulative voting, and so they do cumulative voting, and John gets on the board by cumulative voting. But all the other people there represent more than 51% of the ownership, of total ownership. Mm -hmm. Can they make a motion to remove that person right after he was elected? If you're talking about condominiums, yes. And that has also happened. Just so your readers and people that are watching know, cumulative voting means that you can stack your votes. So if you have five positions on a board that are open, you can vote five times for one person or four times for one person, once for another, or distribute them in an integral way in that way. So with cumulative voting, even though one person may get on with one-sixth of the vote, they could conceivably remo be removed under new business with a majority of the common interest in the condominium world, yes. So... In essence, because I know the statute, just for a clarification for our audience, says that a majority of, of the homeowners, meaning all the 50.1 of everybody, yes. not just those at the meeting, could, re, could remove someone. That the fact that person just got elected, they're not on safe ground if everybody doesn't like them. No. If everybody else doesn't like them, I should right. say. This, and this has happened. And, and it, it's been a trade-off with the statute, but the statute was pretty clear to make a majority of the common interest can remove, and then the subsequent replacement has the same um, requirement. And if I remember correctly, um, let's just pretend that two people got elected by cumulative voting. Okay. Let's pretend that everybody else has enough votes to legally, under the statute, remove them. So they made a motion to remove John and Fred, right. and would their election be on cumulative voting or re-election? Well, the remo no, it would not. And that, that, that has actually been litigated. But the remove, the re and when you think about it, imagine a removal of two people where they can stack their votes up and, and vote twice to remove one person if two of them are up for, for removal. So it doesn't make a lot of sense. So the removal is a majority of the common interest. It's a yes or no vote on either one director or two directors or the whole board, whichever. But you need to have a majority of the common interest in the condominium world. And the re-election, though, would not be bought under cumulative voting. That's correct. Un that's under the, the condominium statute. world, that's right. It's in the statute. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. This, the statute doesn't specifically say um, that the cumulative voting, but the interpretation, the legal interpretation has been removal and replacement does not have cumulative voting because it requires majority of a common interest. So the statute also requires Robert's Rules of Order and doesn't allow for Richard's Rules of Disorder. <laughs> So, uh, and that's from Henry Robert, I guess, back in a long time ago. And uh, I don't have the skill level you do as a parliamentarian, but I did take the entry level tests and join the National Association of Parliamentarians. I was quite curious about this, yeah. this process. So when you're at a meeting and you're an owner, you know, they, they don't understand this. I mean, they don't know, they don't have the skills. What are the ways they can get information at a meeting? There's things called point of order and point of information. Yeah. Can I briefly share with us what that is? Sure. There's Three, there's point of order is not for information. A point of order is bringing to the attention the chair that there's a violation of a rule, a rule is being broken, and it's calling upon the chair to enforce that rule, to make what's called a ruling. So a point of order is not because I want to ask a question about something. Now, if I want to ask a question about something, there's two types of, of questions. One relates to parliamentary procedure. How do I make this motion? Is it in order at this time? Another, that's called a parliamentary inquiry. The other one is request for information. Was this report sent to all owners? That's called request for information, formerly known as a point of information. 
And the chair is not obligated to respond to these. Obviously, if a chair refuses to respond to too many of them, we could end up with a different chair for the rest of the meeting. So it's kind of important that chairs be fair. And, and when it comes to requests for information, it's not considered debatable. Point, uh, parliamentary inquiries are not debatable. They make the, a member makes a statement, a question, and then the chair would respond or ask another member of the audience to respond through the chair. Well, you get hired a lot of times for potentially bad meetings or disruptive meetings or challenging meetings or controversial meetings, whatever word you want to use. From your experience, do you find most of the boards really want to do this right? They just don't maybe have the skill level to deal with all of this uh, motions and things that are going on? Or, or, in, or do you feel that the industry does have a dark side and, 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 and the people do this and willfully and intentionally to prevent democracy from being conducted? In, in my experience, and I, I do about 100 meetings a year, and in, the, in my experience, most boards are honorable people. They consist of honorable people. They may be passionate. They may get on a board for different reasons, maybe to watch their investment, maybe because they want to see certain issues happen. But they, they really do, in, in my opinion, mostly are, are honorable people. They do have their exceptions. They're, they're out there. But, but yeah, most of, most of them are, are, are just trying to do what's best for the association. So anyway, what's your final words since we're in our last minute of, of what do you recommend for annual meetings? What, kind of, what do you recommend for the boards and the owners out there? Well, in the last 30 plus years, one of the biggest hangups in annual meetings has been taking a long time to count the vote especially ballot votes. If you got a ballot vote requirement for election and your bylaws require it, do a ballot vote, otherwise your election could be challenged. Don't waive it, even if three people want three positions, don't waive the ballot unless the bylaws allow you to waive it or the bylaws are silent on the ballot issue. Now, given that, when they do a ballot vote, sometimes it can take 20 minutes up to an hour. So we are looking to get legislation through that will allow the use of electronic voting with adequate security so we can get results within one to two minutes at most the owners will have the results of an election very quickly. So if our new law gets passed allowing electronic voting and someone loses by 22 votes, <laughs> could they appeal it to the Supreme Court? Or? Well, anybody can go down to a courthouse and file paperwork or what have you that avail himself in the legal system in some way, shape, or form. However, part of the law that we're proposing or the bill that we've got that we're hoping they present is going to provide for an audit trail that will say who, who votes when and how at what time. And then there's some issues associated with making sure that's kept confidential with respect to the name of the voter. So it, it seems like we'll have a little bit more accurate result instead of papers which could easily be Xerox copied or, you, you know, and, and, then, uh, and fraudulently changed. I want to thank you for being here. I want to tell our audience that my last comments about annual meetings is be respectful with everyone. You may have disagreements but if you're respectful with everybody, give everybody a right to be heard within the rules of the meeting, you know, you're going to be better off of, of, of having a meeting that's successful at the end of the day. Thank you for coming, Steve. And we look forward to seeing you next week on Condo Insider.